Check one, two. That okay? Camera, microphone, check one, two, three, four. Just want to make sure you guys are good. Sounds weird. Uh -oh. Say what? Hey, look, public radio always shows. Test one, two, test one, two, three, test. Oh, let's have the in house data. That's what it is. We're getting it. Test one, two, two. Yeah, much better. I'm in his house. So good morning, and it's great to be here at the Tufts Launchpad location for Biolabs, which is a biotech accelerator that's doing incredible work supporting cutting-edge life sciences companies and startups here in Massachusetts. We're here today to talk about our future of work report that we um, spent the past four or five months working on and is being released today. We commissioned this report earlier this year to evaluate ways in which the COVID pandemic may have changed work habits in Massachusetts and to help inform our efforts to support the Commonwealth's workers, businesses, and communities as we recover from the pandemic. To announce the report today, we're here with the team from Biolabs to talk about a grant we recently awarded to help them with their job training and accelerator efforts, which is a major component of the report. The Future of Work report explores that work could look, what lo work could look like here in Massachusetts, both in the near term and the long term, up through sort of 2030 or so. It evaluates what the implications of COVID might be for different regions, economic centers, local downtowns, transportation, and public spaces. COVID-19, in many respects, over the past 15 or 16 months, has shifted how Massachusetts residents work and has accelerated many existing factors that impact the future of work, like the use of e-commerce and the adoption of automation in many industries. In addition, new factors have emerged, like the spread of remote and hybrid work models and a reduction in business travel. The report analyzed how these factors impact residents differently based on their region, their industry, their occupation, their gender, their race, and in many cases as well, uh, their geography. Overall, the report concludes that the changing ways of working may shift what we think of as the center of gravity here in Massachusetts away from the urban core and toward the rest of the state. At the same time, changes in the economic landscape will mean that significant workforce training will be needed to connect workers with the skills that they may need for the future economy. Meanwhile, the high cost of housing will remain a challenge, as will the need to ensure all communities can share equitably in the Commonwealth's growth. This means our continuing focus on expanding housing and home ownership opportunities, especially in the communities hardest hit by COVID will become even more important going forward. In total, the report offers eight key insights that also cover things like the need for greater flexibility in transportation and childcare. The report's detailed analysis of workforce and economic trends gives us a roadmap for how we can take tangible steps to make sure that Massachusetts can continue to grow and thrive in a post-pandemic world. After COVID forced an economic slowdown last year, Massachusetts recovery at this point is clearly off and running. We can see that in our tax revenue picture, we're on track to have a big surplus because of the people of Massachusetts and the work that they did to create significantly more economic activity than was anticipated over the past several months. And we have a strong economy that's grounded by key assets 
like our world-class healthcare system, our nation-leading K-12 and higher education systems, and vibrant sectors with incredible startups, like the biotech and life science companies that are represented by this organization here today. In short, we believe Massachusetts is well-positioned as we emerge from the pandemic and look to promote economic growth and recovery going forward. This report provides us with a roadmap to build on our strengths and address areas that remain challenges. And we're already underway in addressing some of the findings that were raised in the report. Last month, we filed a $2.9 billion plan to spend the Commonwealth's federal funds. Not all of them, just some of them. The plan addresses many of the key needs that were presented in the report. It focuses on building up the Commonwealth's housing stock, on supporting its workforce, on dealing with some of the dislocation that will take, take place in downtown economies, and continuing to invest in a variety of key infrastructures. These are urgent priorities which are only underscored by the findings in this report. The plan we filed with the legislature includes a billion dollars for housing priorities, with a particular focus on creating home ownership opportunities in those communities that were hardest hit by COVID. Those communities in particular suffered more than many others here in Massachusetts because of many of the issues associated with housing insecurity, and we believe that needs to be a fundamental part of how we put those federal funds to work going forward. The report that we're releasing today estimates the Commonwealth will need to produce 125,000 to 200,000 housing units by 2030. This $1 billion investment would be a significant step toward addressing the concerns that are raised in the report around the cost of housing and the continued challenges around equity that are associated with housing costs and prices in Massachusetts generally. The plan also includes $240 million for workforce training opportunities to help credential and train workers and connect them with high demand industries, which is a key priority raised in this report. The report concludes that perhaps as many as 300 to 400,000 people may need to transition to different occupations or occupational categories over the next decade as a result of the changing trends in work driven by the pandemic. We're responding by proposing to turbocharge many of our existing training programs, which have a proven track record of recredentialing, reskilling, and providing apprenticeship opportunities for workers here in the Commonwealth and connecting them with high demand jobs. The team here at BioLabs is receiving about $100,000 in a grant from our Workforce Training Fund program. The team will use these funds to train about 30 workers who will in turn support BioLabs work to support like local biotech startups. This effort is all about retraining our workers and building Massachusetts strengths as a leader, especially in innovation and life sciences. In total today, we're awarding about $8 million to about 100 businesses across Massachusetts through this round of grants from the Workforce Training Fund program. These grants will support the training of 4,300 workers with a range of skills in things like project management, advanced software training, and other technical skills. The $240 million that we proposed in ARPA funds, which is obviously a much bigger number, something we believe is going to be critical as we think about how we help people work their way back to work coming out of the pandemic, would enable us to support, obviously, much more in this space. It will allow us to address many of the needs that are raised in the report and also connect many workers to both the skills and the jobs that they'll need to be successful in today and tomorrow's economy. These job training programs are key to meeting these long-term needs, but they're also crucial to closing the skills gap that exists right now throughout our economy and meeting employers' needs today. And that's why it's vital that we take action on many of these elements quickly and begin to invest these funds as soon as possible. We look forward to working with our colleagues in the legislature to make these investments because they will help workers, they will help families, and they will help communities, in many cases those hardest hit by COVID-19, to address the needs that are identified in this report. And by addressing these priorities, we can make sure that Massachusetts builds on its strengths and powers our economy and communities forward as we emerge from this pandemic. I'd now like to turn the 
platform over to the Lieutenant Governor who will talk about some of our initiatives around transportation and child care, which are also key elements of the findings in the report. And I want to thank the BioLabs people again for having us here today. Thank you, Governor. It's great to be here at Launchpad, and thank you to our partners at BioLabs for exciting uh, endeavors here, and look forward to your continued success. As the Governor mentioned, our Future of Work study evaluated how COVID-19 has shifted work habits and other trends across a wide range of industries and communities. The report focused on understanding how these trends differ across seven distinct regions, Boston Cambridge, Greater Boston Urban Residential, Suburban Greater Boston, Suburban Non-Boston, Gateway Cities, Rural tur Tourism Based Economies, and the remainder of our rural communities. The economies of each of these re regions are different, and it's important that we assess them separately to understand how we can best support residents in all parts of our Commonwealth. The Governor just highlighted how our existing job training and housing proposals can respond to the report's findings. The report also concludes that greater flexibility in child care will be crucial to meeting the changing needs of working families and employers. As employers and workers leverage technology to provide greater flexibility for work habits, child care needs will change as well. Our administration is working with the early education community to make improvements to the child care system to respond to these trends. We are investing over $640 million in federal funding for child care, focusing on building capacity at early education providers and targeting funds to the greatest areas of need according to the Social Vulnerability Index. We are also sustaining increased child care subsidies for low-income families and other pandemic-era changes that expand access to care. We also know that we have challenges related to our child care workforce. And to that end, we are leveraging the Commonwealth's workforce development programs to develop a stable pipeline of early educators to expand access to affordable child care. And we are partnering with the business community to best understand specific needs for flexibility across industries and our regions. We are also making investments and modifications across our transportation system to respond to the changing needs of our workforce. While compute, commuter rail ridership will, will still remains low relative to pre-pandemic levels, we are preparing for more workers to return to the office, but their travel patterns are changing. The commuter rail recently introduced its new regional rail schedule. This new approach represents a shift toward more consistent, regular service throughout the day, compared to pre-pandemic service that was heavily skewed toward morning and evening rushes. These adjustments reflect continual analysis of ridership trends throughout the pandemic and into our recovery. The new regional rail schedule supports increasing travel habits like intraline or non-Boston trips, as well as reverse commutes to gateway cities. It also supports teleworkers, local trips, and three-day-per-week commuters. And the T and the commuter rail are also continuing to promote weekend service using incentives such as $10 weekend passes. This will help promote travel to keep recreational, to key recreational and tourist destinations outside of Boston. For example, thanks in part to this commuter rail promotion, Salem is seeing 110% of 2019 weekend ridership this year. That's big. We're also helping communities make investments in streetscapes that will support the changing uses of our downtown spaces. Our Shared Streets and Spaces grant program has helped cities and towns make infrastructure improvements to support outdoor dining and alternative transportation modes like cycling, walking, and off-road trails. A lot has changed. Since last year, the program has awarded $33 million to 183 communities, resulting in over 300 projects. We'll continue to work with our municipal partners to make investments that help them adapt to the changing trends in our workforce and our economy. Thank you, and I'd now like to turn it over to Secretary Acosta, who will talk more about our workforce investments we are announcing today and the impact we could have with more resources from our $2.9 billion federal funds proposal. Secretary Acosta. Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, thank you, LG Governor Johannes, for having us here. So I want to talk to you, I have the pleasure today of just uh, being a little bit more um, detailed on some of the workforce um, portion of the 2.8 uh, million that the governor uh, has proposed. Uh, so this is the $240 million portion of that package. Uh, for me, there were main, three main takeaways um, on this uh, Future of Work report. Uh, first is the importance of taking an equity lens on how we think about our workforce development efforts. This recession, as in the previous one, was particularly difficult on our black and Latino populations in the Commonwealth. The peak 12-month moving average unemployment for Latinos in Massachusetts was 17.5%. For blacks, it was 14.5%. And for whites, it was 9%. Beyond the pandemic-driven employment disparities, women, black, and Latino workers are likely to continue to experience the most displacement from changes to job demand due to automation. And those groups have much more lower levels of access to remote work, opportunities which we now know will make up a larger share of future jobs. Second, I think this report further validates the importance of investing in training programs which match the unemployed to critical growth industries in healthcare, advanced manufacturing, information technology, and the trades. These are good paying jobs and they don't necessarily require a college degree. And we know that in order to build a more resilient and equitable economy in the Commonwealth, we need to foster a workforce ecosystem that meets the skills and needs of the coming decades. Which brings me to my third takeaway, the need to act quickly and take full advantage of this moment. We know we need to build a more equitable workforce. We know we need to find, to fill the skill gaps in critical areas of the Commonwealth in order to maintain our future economic success. And now we have a generational opportunity to do so through federal resources which are immediately available to us. And this is why the Baker Polito administration has proposed to invest over 200 million to surge and scale existing and proven workforce models that will provide retraining pathways for around 52,000 currently unemployed individuals. I'm not usually in the habit of reading you a list, but I think it's important for you to understand what, is, uh, what makes up this 200 million. 100 million is to retain unemployed workers, retrain unemployed workers impacted by COVID and dislocated from low wage jobs with a focus on career ladder programs and industry credentialing for high demand occupations. We're proposing a radical expansion of existing models, including the Career Technical Initiative with $45 million focused on trades and manufacturing the Workforce Competitiveness Trust Fund and Learn to Earn to focus on retraining for populations that need more support to achieve industry credentials. And that uh, is a $20 million proposal. An additional $25 million to expand retraining and programming that can ramp up immediately and expand training enrollment for industry credentials through our rapid reemployment model. $15 million to expand access to training vouchers for individuals working with mass hire needing to enroll in retraining. And $10 million to expand the workforce training fund model to provide grants directly to companies, like we're doing today, to incentivize new hires and train incumbent workforces. And very importantly, $35 million for ESOL language acquisition that is integrated with job training and academic skill uh, building for individuals with, with less than a high school diploma, $25 million for basic work readiness support, including programming through models like Signal Success and ACT Career Readiness Certification, $25 million for high school career pathways to expand connecting activities programming and higher education and school internships, and lastly, $10 million for registered apprenticeship pathways to diversify the apprenticeship labor force and expand models into high demand career pathways in technology, manufacturing, finance, childcare, and others. As a result of accelerated adoption of automation and AI due to the pandemic over the next decade, as the governor said, 300 to 400,000 current jobs in the Commonwealth will disappear. This isn't some distant academic question that will need to be solved by future generations. 
By 2025 to 2030, the ability to successfully reskill approximately 30,000 to 40,000 people per year could lead to a vibrant commonwealth in which new opportunities outpace work growth, uh, workforce growth. The actions we take now can have a real and lasting consequence in building a more equitable and resilient economy, but we need to seize the moment and get to work on these reemployment efforts immediately. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Johannes Fruhoff, um, founder and president of BioLabs. Did I just butcher your last name? No, I didn't. Okay. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Um, uh, Governor uh, Baker, uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito, and uh, Secretary Acosta, Christine Ab A uh, Abrams, and dear guests, good morning. Thank you for doing this event at our site here at Tufts. Um, a little review, BioLab started in Kendall Square um, with this mission to change the way that people build biotech companies. Um, instead of building their own labs, they can in, and buying their own equipment, applying for their own permits. Innovators can now come to us and have ready-made solutions in fully furnished and functional labs available, as you have seen on your tour this morning. This results in millions of dollars saved by each company and greatly accelerated timelines towards uh, discovery of life-saving medicines. We have grown from our first location in Kendall Square, Cambridge, to now 11 labs in 10 cities with more on the way and we're even expanding internationally now. We have also created two nonprofit companies along the way that many of you know well, Launch Bio and Lab Central in, in Kendall Square. BioLabs offers ready-to-use lab space for innovators and has enabled the creation of nearly 400 startup companies since we launched in Cambridge in 2010. BioLabs itself has 50 employees, 30 of which are working here in Massachusetts but we're helping over 1,300 scientists daily to do their work in innovation. Today, we're celebrating the announcement of several workforce training grants, and BioLabs is the recipient of one of them. This grant will allow us to train our employees with a tailored curriculum that includes management skills, team working, important lessons in leadership, work efficiency, and will overall result in higher productivity for us. We're partnering with Bill Ronco, of Gathering Pace Consulting, who I've worked with in, on similar programs for the last 15 years and with very good success. We have seen the value of these programs as they bring new skills to our workforce. For example, many BioLabs employees are great scientists and engineers, but this program will help them learn how to better lead a team, improve their client interaction, learn skills to be good mentors and managers to their own staff. We're grateful to our partners at the Commonwealth Corporation for awarding BioLabs with this grant, and we're confident that this is really well-invested money. BioLabs acts as a great multiplier. Our teams are working with dozens of other startup companies, and these are often following our leads in terms of communication, style of leadership, and other soft skills. So investing in BioLabs also will have a significant multiplier effect by helping hundreds of startups as they develop their own young employees. This grant and similar programs will help make the biotech startup ecosystem stronger in Massachusetts and will help the Commonwealth maintain our leading role as a center for biotech worldwide. It's important to consistently invest in this sector with similar capacity building programs because biotech will only grow as a sector of the economy and will encompass areas outside of healthcare. Think of applications of biotech in food production, data storage, creation of commodity chemicals, and many others. With the assembly of universities, research hospitals, and academic institutions, combined with a strong industrial base, Massachusetts is in a very leading position in this new industrial revolution that is biotech. A golden age is coming, and we're excited to be part of it. Thank you very much. Questions? Say, say you're going to use this report as kind of your evidence base when you're before the legislature to get these uh, programs approved? I certainly think a lot of the elements of this report can be incorporated into both our testimony but also the conversations that we'll have with the legislature about why we think the 
$2.9 billion that we proposed would be a really smart and strategic investment in dealing with many of the changes and the shakeout that's going to come from COVID, yeah. Define quickly, you said 2.9, you want to spend it quickly. Well, some of the... With the, with the legislature, sometimes things go at a glacial pace. Are you hoping that they get this done by the end of this month or maybe next spring? But, well, it's my understanding they're probably going to start holding hearings later this month, which we think is a good step. Um, but some of the initiatives, especially around the retraining, we believe we should try and start as soon as possible. Um, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of people whose extended federal unemployment benefits are going to end in September. And we think it's really important to be able to provide them with an opportunity to get a credential to develop a skill and to find their way into an open opportunity for work. Um, some of the other elements of this will just take a while. Um, the money we propose, for example, around environmental infrastructure, whether you're talking about the combined sewer overflow issues that affect the Merrimack River and so many other bodies of water in Massachusetts, or some of the environmental infrastructure, those pieces are going to take a while to do no matter what. They just take a long time to do the spec work to do the bid work and to ultimately actually perform the work. And this federal funding has to be sort of allocated by 2024 and spent by 2026. Um, and I think some of this requires a long time to get from where we are to where we need to go. Um, the housing stuff that we've proposed falls into a bunch of different categories. You know, a lot of the, the um, sort of assisted-based housing for seniors and for veterans. That takes a while to site and it takes a while uh, to bid and it takes a while to build. Um, same goes for the Commonwealth Builders Program, which uh, I think one or both of you were at the uh, announcement of that $60 million initiative in the summer of 18. And some of the, some of the fruits of that labor are literally just starting uh, to pop now. Now the pandemic happened in between which obviously slowed things down, but a lot of that is just has a lead time on it. Um, I will say this, though, about the housing piece in particular. One of the reasons we focused on down payment assistance is to recognize and understand that we are in the midst of a very explosive growth in housing prices generally, primarily because there was so little supply to begin with and so little construction of new housing over the course of the pandemic. And I worry a lot that we are going to push people who are renting today who might have the ability to buy with down payment assistance out of the communities that they're in because they don't own. And, you know, I've, I've had this conversation with a bunch of folks um, in the legislature and with a lot of my colleagues in municipal government. The, the more we don't do now to provide um, down payment assistance and opportunities for first time home buyers to purchase the homes they own, the more likely they are as renters to be forced out of the communities that they live in currently. If you talk to some of the mayors of some of these mid-sized cities, they'll tell you that you know they have employers who can't find people to work for them. They have uh, big issues around keeping the people who currently live in their communities in their communities because of the rising price of housing and they would like to see something happen now. They would also like to be able to take some of the resources they got through the ARPA uh, program as well, combine it with some of the resources that the state has, and actually do big transformative things in their own downtowns and in their own communities. Now, maybe we'll get around to doing that eventually. Um, if the legislature chooses to adopt a number of the items that we've proposed. But I think we would rather get started on that soon rather than get started on it, you know, nine months or a year from now and miss this significant opportunity we have to hopefully, you know, help people stay where they are and not have to relocate and start all over again. How does rail factor into the housing piece of uh, minority sector? Change, or the of change uh, frequency and make it a little easier to get around, but is there, you know, transit-oriented housing ideas? Is there gateway cities slash transit ideas? Well, all of the resources that we're talking about housing, you could absolutely use on transit-oriented projects. And remember, we just signed an economic development bill that included several key elements to our housing agenda, including the housing choice legislation, which, as people have noted, has started to change the pace and the speed at which communities move to either expand existing housing through accessory dwelling units or to start getting 
go forwards on majority, simple majority votes out of their planning boards and their, and their city councils and their select boards. Um, but there was also in that bill a requirement for communities that are along the public transportation system to do um, multifamily, uh, multi-unit housing on the sites that are located near their, um, their public transit stops. And that is starting to happen as well. I would love to be able to use some of the funds that are associated with the ARPA money to accelerate a lot of that activity. Well, keep in mind that we have, you know, we're actually the first administration to deliver on some big rail expansions in a very long time. The GLX project, which will start, part of that will open at the end of this year and the rest of it will open sometime in early 22. That project we rescued. I mean, I don't think most people would dispute that. That's one of the most significant expansions in rapid transit in a very long time. And people have been talking about South Coast Rail since I worked for Bill Weld in the early 1990s without success. And we were the administration that actually figured out a plan to get that built and to get it funded. And that project will probably finish sometime 2022, 2023. Those are two very significant expansions in both rapid transit and in uh, commuter rail. The other big piece in this, and this is something the Lieutenant Governor worked hard on, was a, um, a very complicated and imaginative acquisition of a significant number of double-decker coaches to dramatically expand the capacity of our commuter rail system without having to add it. There's a limit to how many cars you can put on a train, right? But if you can buy double-deckers, and we're, these are basically refurbished from what I remember, right? Um, which means they're going to come here about four years before they would have come here if we had to buy them new. Um, they're going to give us the ability to do some very significant capacity building without having to add a lot of cars, and that will help us with this whole idea of more frequent trips over a longer period of time with a lot more seats available for people to ride. I'm going to let Secretary Acosta give you the better answer, okay? I'll start with mine. Um, most of those programs are ones that are currently in operation and that have demonstrated success. For example, the Career Technical Initiative, I personally think it's one of the most important things we've done as an administration to provide people with an opportunity uh, to get credentialed and get a really good job. And it's mostly built on relationships with employers, the trades, and uh, the voc tech schools. And she, the three of us have been in and out of numerous schools over the course, you know, pre-pandemic, this thing was rocking. And you literally would have employers kind of standing there like this, waiting for people to finish getting these credentials so that they could hire them. And um, there's no doubt in my mind that that program should be turbocharged. And the more of it we do, the more likely it will be that people will get into those programs, get through them, and be employed when they come out the other end. The apprenticeship stuff, the workforce stuff, these are programs, I would argue that these programs have been doing really good work with really good results for a very long time with a very small amount of financial support. And part of this is about taking a model that already has all the metrics in place to measure performance and determine outcomes and a lot of the key partners and actually dramatically expanding the resources that are available to them so that you're not actually trying to build something new that's never been done before and then figure out how you're going to manage whether or not you're going to be successful. But I'll let you take a crack at this one too. I'm not sure there's a heck of a lot to add after that. Um, but the only thing I will add, um, obviously, the, re the reason that we can scale up so quickly uh, and want to uh, be very focused on where we put this extra money is because these are programs that we have experience with. Uh, these aren't programs that we're, that we're creating, right? These are programs we have experience with and we know how to measure them. Uh, the other thing and the only other thing I would add is that um, everything we do uh, is based on uh, what our regions have told us they need. So a few years ago with the Workforce Skills Cabinet, myself, Secretary Pizer and Secretary Keneally, uh, we developed um, these regional um, areas, right, so that there are seven regions throughout Massachusetts, and each one of them developed blueprints 
on the supply and demand needed in their region. So we know, we know, they know uh, exactly what jobs are needed, who's hiring, and oh, by the way, who's coming out of the schools in their regions. So the task there was how do you bridge that? How do you write the plan to make sure that the people that are graduating, whether it's high school, whether it's community college, whether it's, it's four-year uh, university, how are you going to connect them to open jobs? So that we have track record on. And frankly, the Career Technical Initiative, I couldn't be more excited about it um, because that is, uh, you know, we, we don't do any of these things without an employer on the other end. And that's really important. We're never going to do training just for training's sake. Uh, we're always going to have an employer on the other end uh, willing to hire the folks that we're training. And that's what's been so successful about Career Technical Initiative. And it's, it's brand new. We just started that last, last year. Uh, putting two years ago. Two years ago. Pandemic in the That's right. There we go. Pandemic is kind of the lost year. Um, so, so we are, you know, we're very excited about putting 20, 30, 40,000 uh, adults through our career technical initiative. Um, and uh, frankly, it could be a game changer. These are transformative jobs. I mean, we, in one of our programs, our apprenticeship program uh, called Apprenti, right, is apprenticeships for IT. We take folks that are either unemployed or making twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year. They spend six months classroom training, six months in the company, and they come out with that employer. The employer's already hired them, making seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year. These are humongous life, life a time, uh, family changing dynamics. So I'm super bullish on this, but we do need to get moving because, as the governor said, we've got over three hundred thirty thousand people falling off unemployment on September 4th. And if you ask me what keeps me up at night, it's that. It's not having those people engaged to, to the workforce. We need those folks engaged in, in the workforce immediately. So, what about thank you. That's a that's that's a huge mandate for our um, for our folks, and uh, you know, for me, uh, one of our most important charges because I do. I do think that if we're not very intentional and focused on that, uh, there are folks that can we can be in worse shape than we were before the pandemic. Um, and one of the reasons that we are making sure that we add ESOL training, English as a second language training is so important uh, right now. And if I look at my claimant pool, you know, more than half of the folks that are right now receiving unemployment have a high school degree or less. And we know that there are some uh, wraparound services that these folks are going to need. It's not just training how to use a hammer. It's, it's training to make sure that they understand English. It's making sure that we also put money, $25 million, in work readiness. Uh, so work readiness skills, soft skills, essential skills, whatever you want to call that, uh, to make sure that they're ready. So we are very, very focused on the equity piece of this. Um, and look, let's face it, the industries that got hit the hardest were the low-wage uh, low industries, right? Leisure, hospitality. Most of those were Latinos, um, black workers, and women. I mean, let's not forget the women. Women got hit really, really hard in this pandemic. Uh, so uh, our, our, we're laser focused on that, and, uh, and that's one place that if we're not, uh, we can come out of this pandemic in a worse place than we were. We don't want that. Last question. Let's just follow, follow up on that. Learn to Earn. Yes. That was literally a program we created, I'm going to say, four or five years ago. It was focused specifically on people who had been out of the workforce for a long period of time. Most of those folks came out of communities of color, and it was the first. Usually, when people do job training programs, they try to come up with programs that are the ones that get people quickest back to work because that's how you measure success. We literally set up a couple of programs, got the legislature to fund them at modest levels to see if they could work, that would literally take the long view on trying to help folks who historically have not really been part of that community to get through the process have the support and the help that they needed in many cases. Some of those folks were also ESOL folks and get them through and get them employed. And it's worked, right? So for me, the big issue is, okay, these things work. They worked with modest investments. They were targeted in many cases at exactly the populations we believe are most at risk. So let's put real resources into them and see if we can't get them turboed to the point where they actually serve 10, 15 times as many people as they've served historically because we're going to have the requirement, the demand to do this given who a lot of the folks have been most profoundly negatively affected by COVID are. And they're gonna we need to help them find a way out. Are enough towns and communities taking advantage of new uh, housing zoning laws in six months? Are 
housing choices. Yeah, I mean, I'm a former local official. I have some sympathy for the difficulty that's associated with moving like that on some of this. But um, there are definitely communities that have already taken advantage of this in a pretty serious way. Uh, I think what's the most interesting thing to me is the number of communities that have had um, conversations with um, with developers and others who have said, we'd really like to get into it with you in a big way, given that we're now talking majority vote as opposed to two-thirds, because the time associated with getting a majority vote is just completely different than the time associated with getting a two-thirds. And on some of these ADUs, some of these accessory dwelling units, almost all of those were like six, five, three, two. I mean, they were, they were the kinds of votes that historically would have been majority of firm doesn't pass. And some of this is literally people just teeing up stuff that historically they couldn't get the two-thirds on, but they knew they could get a majority on. And I think one of the things to remember here is that by going from a two-thirds to a majority, you basically make it possible for a lot of stuff that most people supported in the first place but couldn't move forward on because that's not enough. They just teed all that stuff back up and put them through and got majority votes on. I mean, I think the – I do believe that – a lot of the resource in the ARPA bill would make this move a lot faster. Um, it just will. Because communities can then take the resources they got, put it together with the resources that we have, run it through the programs at either mass housing or mass development or um, environmental affairs on a lot of the environmental infrastructure pieces and just go. And not only does that create a lot of um, the kinds of housing supports and infrastructures and other stuff that we want around here, it creates a ton of jobs for people in the trades who can come through those CTI programs as well. Thanks, everyone. Governor, uh, one just an off-topic question. Several uh, Republican donors have sent a letter to the state party and said they're not contributing to the state party unless it's a change in the leadership uh, there in the state party. Uh, a lot of those contributors have contributed to new initiatives. Uh, do you support their position, and do you think there should be a change in the leadership of the state party? Well, I've said, um, and so is the Lieutenant Governor, by the way, so have many other existing elected Republicans and previously elected Republicans have said that we don't believe many of the recent decisions and statements that have been made by the leadership at the state party are consistent with where we believe most Republicans are generally. And, I mean, the state committee, at the end of the day, um, needs to make decisions about um, the state party apparatus. That's, that's their role. That's their responsibility. But I'm not surprised that a number of folks who have been loyal, donor, generous donors and supporters to the party have raised serious concerns about some of the things that have been coming out of the state committee, and I hope they address them. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. And thanks to BioLab for hosting us today. Much appreciated. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.